Uh, the chair moves House File 375 be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. We do have an author's amendment, and this is the bill's first hearing. So the chair will move the A1 author's amendment. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, Representative Joachim, can you explain your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. The A1 amendment just narrows the bill a bit to what scope of outpatient treatment is allowed. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, all in favor of the uh, A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Joachim, welcome to the division. Please present your bill as amended. And I want to remind folks that we do have a hard stop at 10 o'clock and that uh, I want to make sure that we have this voted and done by that point in time. Thank you, Representative Joachim, go ahead. Good morning, members, and Mr. Chair, thank you for hearing this bill. Um, we've all witnessed the growing stress that our young adults face today and have heard testimony in many of our committees about the need for mental health support in our schools and communities. While the stress our students face existed before COVID-19 and will exist long after, the global pandemic has shown a harsh light on the lack of support and a safety net for those students who are struggling. This bill is a small step that we can take to give our students the tools they need to access mental health supports before things become dire. In current law, a 16 and 17 year old is allowed to check themselves into an inpatient facility of their own accord, but cannot access the help of mental health professionals in an outpatient setting without parental permission. I first learned of this odd discrepancy when I had coffee with Ms. Livstein, an engaged student that you will hear from momentarily. With this bill, it is our hope to allow young adults to get the help they need long before requiring a hospital stay. Delaying urgent care can be costly in so many ways. Sometimes these delays can be as simple as a language barrier or time constraints for the parents of the student, or it may be just a lack of knowledge of the resources available. Whatever the case may be, we want our young adults to get the needed help without the costly delay. Members, you should know you have three letters of support in front of you for this bill. They're from NAMI, the Minnesota School Psychologist Association, and the Minnesota Psychology Association. I also have a group of incredible students here today to share their stories with you. I will let them introduce themselves um, as they go along, but the first one is Liv Steen. She's a Hopkins High School senior who is a member of the Hopkins School Group called Mental Health Matters, and Ms. Steen also serves on the Minnesota Youth Council. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Uh, Ms. Livstein, if you'd like to go ahead, introduce yourself and uh, start your testimony, please. And welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My name is Livstein. I'm a senior at Hopkins High School, uh, president of Mental Health Matters and representative for the Minnesota Youth Council. Mental Health Matters works to bring student voice and advocacy into school mental health services. A few years ago at Hopkins High School, we were assessing the barriers to mental health services at school. The two biggest barriers we discovered were transportation and parental consent. Parental consent is often due to family dynamics, cultural differences, and generational differences. I've had friends and fellow students tell me about the struggles of bringing up the topic of mental health in their homes. They told me their parents would tell them to suck it up or that mental illness isn't real. I've had friends who have spent years trying to convince their parents to let them go to therapy, and it is not because their parents didn't care about them, but because they were afraid of their child's suffering. And letting them go to therapy is like admitting that their child is suffering. No parent wants a child in pain. A similar thing happened to me with a key difference. We spoke about mental health in our house, and still it took an unnecessary amount of time to convince my parents to let me to go to let me go to therapy. I know that I was very lucky, especially acknowledging the generational differences of my parents and me. And me. My mom, 65, and my dad, 71. The decision was even harder for them would, um, as they have many more mental blockages around mental health and mental illness due to their generation. Um, I reached out to a representative Joachim uh, two summers ago to get the ball rolling around this bill. That is where this comes in. Um, in the process, I reached out to students and former students around the state who have had similar experiences. Here is one excerpt from one of those former students. Mental health never has never been discussed in my the former student's household. And when I brought it up to the, it was shrugged off and seen as not a black people thing. Later, 
was I was ridiculed for isolating and missing school due to my depression. This went back and forth between my parents. They made me feel like something was wrong with me. The former student continues. How was I supposed to think anyone would listen? It definitely didn't make me want to stay here, meaning alive. Um, they later go on to tell me about how it made them resistant to treatment later on. But once they grew out of that, um, they started outpatient treatment and they said it was nice to have someone to acknowledge the significance of their pain. Uh, that is just one of many students, um, such former students, um, whose parents were not horrible people. Their parents just grew up differently and it made the road to recover harder. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steen, for your testimony. And thank you for, for coming before us to testify today. Uh, next, we have Ms. Linda Nayakundi. I hope I'm pronouncing that some very closely there. Uh, please introduce yourself and start your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you were really close. Um, I'm Linda Nyakundi with Mental Health Matters, and I'm also a senior at Hopkins High School. And I chose to volunteer in support of this bill to bring to your attention another point of view on this topic. I was born in Kenya into a culture where discussing topics like mental health was looked down upon. I believe I can speak for most when I say I am incredibly thankful for the mental health resources that my district has available. And as I continue to grow older and continue to learn more about mental health, I found it rather difficult to have these conversations with my parents, seeing as it is shut down and um, mental health is so, sort of an embarrassing thing to talk about. Um, knowing that I would be able to make the decision on my own if I was ever wanting to seek help um, would be a sigh of relief and give me more time to explain and ease this conversation in with my parents, seeing as I would want to have them involved, it would just take a little longer um, to get the confirmation from them as well. Um, and I think it is important that when help is needed and um, if I were to ever seek immediate help that I would be able to get it. and. Um, Having this bill be passed would be really helpful in um, being able to start that conversation with my parents and as well with some other students that might be in my position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nakuti, for coming and speaking to us today. I appreciate that. Uh, next, we'll move on to Ms. Joria Jama. If you'd like to start your presentation, please. Thank you for coming to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. My name is Juaria Jama. I'm a junior at Spring Lake Park High School, and I represent Congressional District 5 on the Minnesota Youth Council. So I wanted to share my story with you all. I'm here this morning in support of House File 375. Around this time last year, I was going through one of the worst mental health crises of my life. I was a student that was usually really attentive and engaged in school, but when my depression hit rock bottom, I couldn't force myself to be interested in class. Even my teachers began noticing as my grades started to slip and I wasn't sure where to turn to. My teachers began noticing and tried to help me as much as they could, extending my essays and helping me take my tests at home, but it wasn't enough. I had to rely on their support and care for me to get me through the year, but they couldn't do more than that. Teachers are extremely important in helping students, but they are not our therapists. While my teachers could extend assignments for me, they couldn't talk to me about my mental health or help me get better. The only other option I had was to turn to my school counselor. Our school only has one counselor that is stretched thin across our entire district. And at our high school, like many high schools across the state, they require parental consent before allowing us to get a mental health referral through our counselor. The requirement of parental consent for mental health treatment in high schools and clinics prevent a lot of young people like myself from being able to get help. Because many parents do not believe or understand why their kids need support, this stops us. A lot of this comes from the stigma surrounding mental health, but also the cultural and religious backgrounds that some families come from. In certain ethnic households like my own, mental health isn't something that is prioritized, and some elders believe that you can pray the depression away. In other households where young people might be getting abused, their parents can stop them from seeking help, and this continues the cycle of depression leading to suicide in young people. I believe that we are way past the time needed to give better mental health access to young people. And if a bill like this was in place last year, I may have been able to get the help I needed faster. I hope you all are able to listen to the concerns of young people like myself and that this bill is able to pass. Thank you for your time. 
You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Jama. And I want to say thank you once again to all three testifiers. You all have done a, uh, an excellent job of presenting, and, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your stories with us. I do see a uh, hand up with Representative Mueller. Representative Mueller, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to thank um, Representative Joachim and the testifiers for your really um, powerful and helpful testimony today. So thank you. And um, as you were talking, Ms. Jama, I was also thinking about um, other high school students who might be accessing um, counselor services within their school and needing parental consent who are 14 or 15 years old. Um, and I recognize that this bill isn't um, necessarily going to those age groups, but I wouldn't mind in the future if we uh, could talk about extending it to them as well. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Mueller. Uh, and I would also like to say uh, to Representative uh, Yoel came into our test buyers, thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, very strongly supportive of this. I, I appreciate uh, Ms. Shama, the stories that you told. I worked for 14 years in the homeless youth world and a number of our youth, uh, one of the frustrations I had is that some of our youth that we were working with needed mental health services, but because they were under 18, the parents were still able to interfere and prevent that from occurring. So I wanna thank our author for bringing it forward and for you, Ms. Shama, uh, Shama for, for being able to state some of the things that some of the youth out there are dealing with. And with that, I see Representative uh, Baker has his hand up. Representative Baker, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Joachim. This is a, a really good uh, conversation to have. I do support this, but maybe a question I have to the author is, and I really do understand where some family dynamics make it really hard for the, the conversation to happen with, with, with mom and dad about mental health and they don't understand depression, they don't understand addiction, they don't understand those things because of their culture, because of their upbringing and so on. At some point, Representative, does does the parent get involved or is it made aware of? And can you just walk me through that so the parents know how they can be part of the support system then? So is this kept a secret or I just, I kind of want to get that, so thank you. Representative Joachim, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Baker, for the question. I'm really glad you asked it. I point to the letter from NAMI, um, and the reason why we have the support we do is because part of um, treatment and part of um, part of the whole um, wraparound services of when you do work with kiddos with mental health issues is bringing the parents in as soon as they can and as soon as it feels right and safe due to the mental health professionals will decide that. And that's why they weren't concerned about having that, just that entry point for students to be able to talk to somebody first because part of therapy is definitely those support networks. So yes, they would be, they would be pulled in. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Baker, any other questions? Okay, I am not seeing any other hands up for questions. Representative Joachim, closing comments, please. Um, I just want to thank the real voices that matter here, and that's Ms. Ms. Steen, Ms. Naikundi, and Ms. Jama for being willing to come here and share their stories and share their testimony, and frankly, to bring this bill and put it into action. Without our young people really pushing us and letting us know what they're experiencing, sometimes they get totally left out of good public policy, and that's what this is, good public policy, and I would love your support. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Joachim. There being no further discussion, the Cherry News is motion that House File 375, as amended, be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Fisher. Aye. Fisher, aye. Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Frankie. Aye. Frankie, aye. Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Baker. Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Hanson. Aye. Hanson, aye. Katiza Batoon. Aye. Katiza Batoon, aye. Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert, aye. Moeller. Aye. Moeller, aye. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Uh, there being 10 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. The, there being 10 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. House file 375, as amended, is recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee.